Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Praxis 1313. We, we live in dark times. It's been a difficult summer. With the rise of the alt-right, the fallout from decades of neoliberal policies, the xenophobic sentiments rising, the, the war on terror now for 17 years. Uh, we live in times that I have never appreciated were so precarious. Uh, it kind of hit me this summer. And it really calls on us to think hard about what is to be done, to, to think about it, to do it, to write about it, to take, I think, a different attitude in our being, in the way, in the way that we, we think and act. And that's what this seminar series is going to be about. It's going to be calling us to, as critical theorists, to kind of change the way we do what we do so as to turn more to the form of being that is praxis in contrast to mere contemplation or even just diagnosing crises which we're very good at, and which is important, and which we have to continue to do. But we also need to think differently about what is to be done. So our project this year is to read contemporary texts on that question, texts from a range of political and militant views, but that we will be reading from a critical perspective. We'll be reading Chantal Mouffe's a uh, book on, uh, for a left populism. We'll read Hart and Negri's book, Multitude. We'll read Moton and Harney on the undercommons. But we'll also read Bernie Sanders, uh, his guide to political revolution and the indivisible practical guide for resisting the Trump agenda from a critical theoretic perspective to mine it and see, to really try and understand it, as well as some writings from the alt-right to really understand what what people are, are telling us to do. The idea here is to critically explore contemporary calls for action and programs for the critical theoretic, from a critical theoretic perspective. Now we're calling this critique and praxis. As I noted in my introductory uh, post uh, on the blog for today, and I would encourage everyone to read the blogs, our, our guests have written extraordinary essays uh, for the for the blog and that are uh, preliminary to this conversation. But as I note in my introductory post for today, uh, this isn't a seminar on Marx, uh, despite the expressions that he practically coined, right? And it's not a seminar on Aristotle either, despite the fact that praxis and the way of being of praxis would be so closely associated uh, with Aristotle. But it's a seminar that draws on uh, and tries to push critical theory uh, in the direction of Marx's way of doing philosophy, uh, of overcoming philosophy, maybe, um, uh, 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 that draws on his relation to praxis. And if it hadn't been so overused, uh, I would have placed as the epigraph to this entire series, of course, the 11th thesis, right? So. Um, critical theory has been inflected at various points in history uh, with a turn towards a greater attention to the form of, 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 of thinking and, uh, that, that can be described as praxis. And these times we find ourselves in today, I think, uh, necessitate that. Now it's a challenge. It's a challenge to push critical theory in that direction. Um, uh, and so what we thought we would do as a first seminar would be to just investigate that question itself, right? The relationship between praxis and theory uh, and what it might entail. Um, and, and there are different ways at which one can come uh, to the question. And of course, coming, I even the direction that one comes to the relationship between theory and praxis itself will probably inflect the way we end up thinking about it. 
because so often we come to it from the theoretical perspective. So, so often we come to it from the perspective of theorizing our actions or applying theory, right? Or drawing the implications of theoretical uh, thought for a practical action, which itself then shapes uh, the outcome as a particular form of application of thought. Um, and one of the challenges is to ask whether, and in part, uh, Karuna Mantena asked that question uh, in her post, and, and we'll discuss this, whether coming at it from the other perspective, uh, coming at it from action uh, uh, towards theory, whether that would actually change things. Now, all of these questions raise uh, important puzzles about the relationship between um, praxis and politics, between theory and truth uh, and power. Uh, which, of course, calls to mind Arendt's essay uh, on truth and politics, where we're going to begin. And, of course, uh, it raises these challenges to answering the imperative question uh, of what is to be done. Um, at the same time as we're launching this uh, seminar series today, we're also launching a kind of digital publication effort uh, with the idea that... Um, Temporality has changed in the digital age, and we just don't have time uh, to go through the kind of conventional processes with our writing, that, it's, that we have to get these thoughts out now, because by the time that they've been vetted and edited, in a year from now, the crises will be entirely different. Um, and so uh, on the website, we just, uh, we've just launched, um, <coughs> under the book forum tab, uh, uh, an open access uh, uh, review process, uh, for uh, one manuscript uh, that I wrote this summer uh, called Critique and Praxis, uh, an answer to the question, what is to be done? Now, um, to launch uh, the seminar today, we are absolutely delighted to have three extraordinary guests who have thought so much about uh, these questions of, uh, of theory and praxis, who have thought so much about power and, and, uh, and, and political forces and, uh, and realistic politics. We're going to start with Stephen Lukes, who joins us from NYU, uh, one of our leading social theorists and critical theorists today. He's the author of a number of seminal books from Emil Durkheim, his life and work, uh, to Marxism and morality, and perhaps for us today, most importantly, power, a radical view. Uh, Lukes, as you know, is a fellow at Balliol College at Oxford, a professor at the European Institute uh, University Institute in Florence, a professor of moral philosophy at the University of Siena, a professor of sociology at the London School of Economics, which brings him fortunately to us in New York, right? So we're really delighted to have you with us, Stephen. After Stephen uh, talks, then we'll turn to Karuna Mantena, who joins us from Yale, where she teaches political and social thought. Uh, and uh, who's been a guest with us uh, at previous 1313s, and we're really delighted to have her back. Uh, and she writes and thinks right now brilliantly on these matters of political realism. Uh, she's the author of Alibis of Empire, Henry Maine and the Ends of Liberal Imperialism, which analyzed the transformations of 19th century British imperial ideology. Uh, her current work focuses on political realism, politics of nonviolence, and the political thought of Gandhi. Um, and we're delighted to have you back, as well as Ann Stoller, who are we are absolutely delighted to have back again at 1313. Uh, and uh, who joins us, of course, from the New School for Social Research, where she is the Willie Brandt Distinguished Professor of Anthropology and History. Uh, she's the author of many remarkably uh, brilliant books, most recently Duress, Imperial Durabilities in Our Times, uh, which came out in 2016, and it focuses on the political effects and practices uh, that imperial projects have produced, um, as well as a number of other uh, exceptional books along the archival grain. Uh, you're familiar with many of these, uh, Carnal Knowledge and Imperial Power, and of course, Race and the Education of Desire, Foucault's History of Sexuality and the Colonial Order of Things. Now, uh, before we kick it off uh, with Stephen Lukes, um, uh, I wanted to uh, also introduce Guylaine Page, 
who is joining us as the executive coordinator of the Center for Contemporary Critical Thought, and thank uh, Guylaine Page for all her work making all of this possible. Um, uh, Guylaine joins us, she just graduated from Barnard, uh, where uh, she studied both political science and Africana studies. And uh, she actually epitomizes the, um, the, uh, the bringing together of, of theory and praxis. So uh, she's done a lot of terrific work uh, tutoring out at Rikers and uh, running the Democratic Students Organizations here. So thank you, Guylaine, for uh, everything and for getting us going. So, Stephen, will you take it away? I'll try. Um, we have a pretty full agenda, I can see. Um, so, what I am um, going to do is I'm going to continue. Uh, this is the continuation of a, of a conversation which Bernard and I began uh, in Chicago and then continued in Princeton, mainly about power and truth. And now, what I'm going to do in 20 minutes is first pinpoint the heart of what I think is our disagreement <coughs> by indicating where I disagree with Bernard's point of view. Then I'll present the gist, the skeleton of an argument that's set out in, uh, in the paper that I put on, uh, posted, uh, which was a lecture earlier this year. And, uh, and, I, and I'm going to try to make clear what the grounds are, or the reasons for which I take issue with Bernard, because I didn't do that in the paper, in the lecture. Uh, and then, um, uh, as instructed, I'll try and say something about the practical implications of all this, um, about what is to be done. Not that I'm going to say, maybe what I'm going to may maybe say about that is mainly negative. Um, I'm going to suggest, uh, the, the so uh, Bernard, in um, his uh, two writings that I've been reading, the, 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 the article, on new, new Critical Horizon, Critical Theory and Practice, and the book, which he's just put, put up online, um, he does me the honor of quoting me uh, in order to say where he disagrees with me. Uh, and in both places, he helpfully quotes me writing um, uh, as follows. That, um, uh, that he says correctly, he says that um, I think that uh, and I wrote this in the paper on false consciousness, that there's, there is truth to be attained, a correct view that is not itself imposed by power. Uh, Bernard rightly states that I argued there uh, that, that, that Foucault's view, on Foucault's view, by contrast, there can be no normative judgments based because there's, there's power all the way down. Uh, he writes that, uh, Bernard writes that for Foucault, Sorry, he, he says that I write <laughs> that for Foucault, there can be no liberation from power, either within a given context or across contexts. And there's no way of judging between ways of life uh, since each imposes its own regime of truth. Oh, we're, we're familiar with this, I guess. Now, um, Bernard then refers in, 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 his, in both of these places to the fundamental tension between what he calls the Frankfurt School epistemology and Foucault's critique of knowledge. And I'm going to quote just a, a paragraph from Bernard. The first view, that's to say the Frankfurt view, uh, on that view, the ac access to truth, to true facts, and thereby to emancipation from illusion, is achieved by acquiring the right social theory. On the second view, uh, which is, I guess, his and Foucault's, there's no access to powerless knowledge. They can be, at best, an unveiling of current forms of oppression or relations of power achieved through the denaturalization of dominant ideas. On the second view, that's this view, uh, we do not achieve an end state but reach another place from which we will again need to emancipate ourselves. We do not escape relations of power. We never do. We're always embedded in them. Power, uh, power recirculates. When we shed illusions, when regimes of truth shift, we are merely at another place where power relations are thickly in place, at play, thickly at play. And this may be problematic, they may be problematic, they may become entrenched, and where we will need to revalue how we govern and are being governed. End of quote from Bernard. Now, I agree, I want to say, I agree with, I agree with a less extreme version of some of this. I agree 
that there's no external and value-free way of judging between ways of life. And, uh, but I don't agree that the issues can be reduced to talk of contending regimes of truth. I agree that we never escape relations of power, but think, uh, but, but think that we can reduce and sometimes eliminate this, its distorting effect, the distorting effects of power, by engaging in practices governed by norms that counteract or correct the distortion. That's my view. I agree that, as Foucault famously said, power is everywhere, but I don't agree that power is always equally thickly at play, as Bernard puts it. I don't hold that access to truth and true facts depend on acquiring the right social theory, which Bernard says att attributes to the Frankfurt School. Um, now, I'm not a Frankfurter. I'm not a Frankfurter. Indeed, I've criticized Habermas and Rainer Forst on exactly this, these issues. But I do continue to hold that there are truths that are correct views not imposed by power, that power does not go all the way down, and I want to insist that there are norms and institutions that enable us to engage in practices that are truth-tracking enabling us to be truth-seeking. Uh, that's to say, to unmask illusions and to, to, to uh, distinguish what is true from what is not in various domains. It's not always the same kind of thing. Though politics, as I shall argue in a second, is a special case, and I'll try with Hannah Arendt's help to indicate why I think that. So one very fast way, because I've got to be fast because of the time, uh, for this purpose, if we may indicate where Vernon and I, I disagree, I, the, b the best way maybe to do this is just to indicate various formulations that Bernard uses that make me uneasy. One, of course, is the Foucaultian uh, phrase, regimes of truth, savoir, pouvoir, pouvoir, savoir, I forget which it is, I think it's savoir, pouvoir. Another, is, another point, uh, another formulation, is Bernard's view that liberalism is among the illusions we need to shed. And that's important. I'm coming to that in a second. And from which we need to emancipate ourselves. As opposed to the illusion that liberal principles are, or ever have been, adequately um, realized in our actual political practice. I actually think that the way in which Bernard, in his writing, especially in the book, deploys and draws large implications from what he calls anti-foundationalism, is described to another illusion. Since we need to specify which foundations are uh, unattainable, unsustainable, not all truth claims and theories have lost their metaphysical and epistemological grounding because of this widespread and, I think, lazy acceptance of this overarching ism. And another claim I resist is that the rule of law, and here I, I, I defer, of course, to Bernard's uh, life experience and knowledge, but nevertheless, I uh, resist the idea that the rule of law is, as he writes more than once, infinitely, infinitely flexible, rather than, uh, rather than let's say, always vulnerable to power, uh, the imposition of power. And that's to say, always vulnerable to any power-imposed interpretation of what the law is or laws are. And then finally, uh, the, uh, the, there is the formulation that he takes from Foucault that politics is best understood as on the model of class war, of civil war, a domain of conflict between enemies rather than adversaries within a common framework. Now that list should suffice, I think, from now to indicate where our disagreements are located. So let me know, have I got time to go to the skeleton of what that, of the argument is that I would seek, I mean, I seek in the lecture that I circulated to, to set out, but here's the skeleton of it. So basically that text is a reflection on two sentences, two rather wonderful sentences from Anna Arendt. The first of these sentences is, no one ever doubted the truth in politics are rather on rather bad terms with each other. And the second sentence is a question. Is it the very essence of truth to be impotent and the very essence of power to be deceitful? 
Now, uh, what I'm going to do, or what I do in there, and I'm just going to hint at it here, is ask in what way truth might be impotent, truths might be impotent, and power deceitful, and how power can render truth imp impotent. And I'm going to suggest that th these questions are acute in a special way in politics. So, truth. Well, there are many kinds of truth, and I'm not going to go into all that now, but uh, let's say that they fail to, re they f they're impotent. Truth is impotent when it fails to register. That's to say, when a truth, truths are ignored or rejected or when recognized, fail to guide action. As for power, okay, three second summary of what I think about that. Um, let's say power is, um, uh, can be intentional, but needn't be. And uh, let's say I offer the following definition uh, of power to this for this purpose that uh, it's the uh, capacity, it's the ability to secure compliance uh, with the interests of those who have it. Um, so how can power be a danger to truth? I think it's by subverting or distorting the ways in which truths are discovered or transmitted. Call this truth tracking. Now, interest-driven partisans can do this in all kinds of ways. But truth tracking can be protected from power by norms that operate within fields. And I'm using fields here in the sense of Pierre Bourdieu, Bourdieu who after all is a theorist of power. And the fields I have in mind are science, journalism, law, and public administration. In each of these fields, you've got truth tracking practices, that's to say, ways of aiming at objectively, at objectivity, um, basing conclusions on evidence, avoiding bias, and interest driven outcomes. Now, look at these practices within um, fields, uh, which is what Bourdieu does. The, the, the what happens in each case, I claim, this is the skeleton of what I want to say, is that the participants in each field, scientists, journalists, uh, lawyers, and public administrators, in each field what they do, uh, they're in competition with one another uh, for resources and also for status within the field. Uh, through an, uh, and, and they're in competition they're, they're for these things, resources and status, uh, they do this through mutual, they get the status through mutual recognition, and they're united in each case by a shared understanding of the game that they're all playing, whose rules they all accept as legitimate. That's the way those fields work. And mutual trust and solidarity is what keeps them together. And success in each field, science, journalism, uh, law, public administration, success consists in winning by the rules of the game, uh, not by winning at all costs. I, it's not as though this is a, a fight that's with there's no holes barred. The, there are rules, there's a game that everybody's playing and everybody knows that's the game. Now, politics. This is where I think Hannah Arendt is, comes in very helpfully. This isn't a field like the others. Why? Because the rules of the game are themselves up for grabs. That's to say, the shared understanding can't be assumed to exist. Politics is in part about, you could say, the achievement of that or the maintenance of that common understanding. The game itself and its governing norms can be called into question. And that's where, uh, that's what's happening today, I claim, right now here in America and also in other countries. That's the crisis that Bernard began by talking about. You've got, I just want to quote very briefly from one of my favorite radio broadcasters, Rush Limbaugh, um, <laughs> who uh, some long before Fox News and everything, but like something like 12 years ago, uh, denounced academia and science and uh, basically the enemy and said this, we live in two universes. Uh, that's to say, the whole of science and academia were, were in the other universe for him. He says, one universe is a lie. One universe is entirely a lie. Everything run, dominated, and controlled by the left, here 
and around the world is a lie. The other universe is where we are, said Rush Limbaugh, and that's where reality reigns supreme and where we deal with it, and we deal with it, and seldom do these universes ever overlap. That was bef long before, or at least 10 years before, Fox News, which enacts all of this. Now, Republicans have come to see politics exactly in this way, as civil war. <coughs> A new kind, and so what I claim, this is my thesis, I claim we, we, what we are seeing is a new kind of polarization. It's not a, a polarization between left and right, but it's between something like this. It's between the promotion of credulity and the survival of credibility. They, the other side, see, I mean, of course, just in a quick parenthesis, I mean, it's not as though we're not all tribal. We are. We all read certain newspapers and watch certain TV uh, programs and <laughs> have our own furrows or, or, or niches or um, whatever they're called, uh, silos. But nevertheless, I claim the polarization is asymmetrical because they see themselves not as facing adversaries in a common field of struggle, but as enemies to be defeated. And here I'm using, a, 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 you mentioned Chantal Mouffe before, a very useful distinction she makes between enemies and adversaries. We are faced with an enemy, we are faced with uh, a, a whole uh, segment of, of, of politics who treat us as enemies. So it's an asymmetrical polarization. And what I think is that liberalism, which uh, Bernard suggests we should view as uh, illusory, I think it's the always imperfectly realized project of making liberal democratic institutions and norms <coughs> function. And of course, if possible, function well. So the illusion about liberalism that I would focus on is, to th is the illusion of thinking that it's realized when it isn't. So how many minutes have I got left? Three, two, three. practical implications. You see, I've only left myself three minutes. Never mind. <laughs> Here is my thought. I think I agree with what Bernard writes, that if it's a question of uh, answering, addressing the question what's to be done, the answer is struggle in all, on all fronts. But I think that struggle has to be, and I think he probably agrees with this, as I think he says it somewhere, it has to be prefigurative. It has to be a struggle which embodies the, the project, what we're aiming at. So I don't think this is uh, correctly to be understood as struggle uh, that, 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 that is a struggle um, uh, at all costs. It has to be struggle uh, that, that involves the idea of the norms that should be in place. So it's not by viewing, one shouldn't view the very project of liberalism as an illusion. Uh, and therefore, to be more concrete about this, I don't think the answer to Republicans in to contemporary politics right now is for liberals or Democrats, more generally, to go onto a war footing. Uh, I mean, the, the Republicans you know, the, 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 the refusal to consider Merrick Garland, uh, the gerrymandering, everything, all of it, all the breakings of all the n neglect of rules, which of course is carried to an extreme uh, in the case of Trump himself, but the rest are now going along um, for reasons we understand. That is not the path that Democrats should be taking. Right now, I think the fight is within, should this is really following from my argument, the fight should be within the fields to uphold their norms and protect their boundaries from corruption and invasion from politics. So if you want a slogan for me to end up with, it would be to fight for and in the fields. Thank you, Stephen, and thanks for um, kind of bridging uh, the questions of, uh, of praxis and politics and truth <laughs> and theory in that way for us, and so directly uh, addressing the questions. 
of especially what is to be done. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Karuna, <laughs> in, in three minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Bernard, for inviting me back uh, to this conversation. You were, um, sorry. Pull it, pull it more see. towards you. Okay. Just bring it, bring it close. Is there it on? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, but I think you were being uh, extremely generous to say that I've thought as long and as, as hard on this, uh, on this question. Um, it is a very large question, and, I, and I'm only going to say a few introductory remarks and, and, and hope to have time for a more open discussion. Um, but at least in the beginning, I think I share and I take the provocation Bernard uh, began with and that the orientation of this seminar assumes or at least tries to reckon with a, a sense of a lacuna in contemporary critical theory in which critique um, has arguably lost its connection with and focus on practice or praxis. Um, that as uh, Bernard uh, implicated or indicated that um, there is a genre of critical theory that focuses on the theorization of crisis, diagnostic, and maybe even a genre of uh, critical theory that is a permanent critique or at least styles itself uh, in, that, in that mode. Uh, and neither of them are very easy in terms of what their connection to is in practice. And there may even be, and I will, we all might be subject to this, a kind of professional problem of theorists, always a kind of recursive distance <laughs> from finally getting to the question of practice. But I take that there is an urgent question of what is to be done, and there is something, um, where, there's something different when critique is praxis or something like critical practice. Uh, one of the, uh, and I think this is something I would like to open up to discussions, is what, what we mean by critical theory in some sense as a tradition of the 20th century in which at least one version I think we're familiar with or one definition is one that takes the practice of critique to be focused on um, outlining the agents and the sites for and of revolutionary or radical practice. And certainly, um, I, in some sense, the orientation of the seminar takes to be that some of uh, this, um, part of the reason that praxis is in crisis in some ways is because there is a loss of the revolutionary horizon or a certitude about who this, who the agents of transformation are, or, or a social class is the privileged mode. Um, I want to come back to whether that in, in itself is, leads to the kind of loss or the crisis itself of, of just who the social actor is. Um, I think there are other ways to conceive of what the place of critique, what, what other things that the purpose of critique or in critical social theory was also trying to do. Now, but I do take, again, I, I am sympathetic with the question, and I think there is a very, um, a, there's an analogous worry in contemporary political theory about a distance from political practice. It's my field, so I'm going to talk about what that debate has looked like and see if we can learn from, learn from it. So the, the critique has, in the last two decades, taken the name of realism, and at least in one <coughs> version of it, um, Raymond Goy's philosophy and real politics, I think there is a genuine uh, intellectual overlap with the uh, demands of critical theory, or at least in some form. Um, and I think the realist critique of political theory has, I think, really, uh, it, it similarly wants to place the question of political practice back at the center of political theorizing, and I think in some ways really is trying to think through the question of theory and practice. I, um, I don't, um, and I think here when we think of theory and practice, I would say m what, we, what I would like us to think about is that maybe we have to think the problem with coming to the question of practice is both a problem of how we think about what theory is uh, and also a, pr a problem of how we, what we think action is. So I'll start with the first, because um, I think that is the real target of realist critiques of political theory is a question of how political theory thinks, theory, what, what it thinks theory is. So Raymond Goyes, Bernard Williams, and others. Uh, sorry, my Siri just turned on. Um, <laughs> um, the realist critique is really a critique of what they take to be the dominant orientation of political philosophy in the last two or three decades around ideal theories of justice, especially John Rawls, and to some extent, uh, maybe the third gen, second, third generation of Frankfurt School around um, Habermas in some form, and some sense that these theorists give, um, the priority is given to generating a general ethical theory from which principles of political obligation or normative foundations of political institutions can be deduced or specified. 
the critics argue that in some sense either they give different accounts of why this is a problem but either uh, or the cause of the problem either it's an assimilation of political theory to moral theory uh, maybe there's also an ambitious t ambition to systematicity and universality that tends to promote an abstract or top-down model of reasoning in which theoretical questions about politics and resolutions are sought independently of an analysis in Goyce's terms of real politics, of the motivations, experiences uh, of political actors and the existing configurations of, and dynamics of political life, the real functioning of institutions, et cetera. I think some of this is, um, I think some of this is deeply ingrained in political philosophy. In fact, Arendt also thinks of it as a, a long, just long conflict between Plato and Aristotle about what is political knowledge and what kind of knowledge about the political world uh, is uh, presumed to be deductive or inductive in some form. Um, but I think in these two, at least in the Rawlsian, I think in the, Kant, uh, uh, in the Habermasian and the Rawlsian versions, there is a kind of Kantianism that um, has also, you know, the focus is on normative foundation, and I think the Kantianism also leads to a suspicion or worry about uh, the realm of practice as one in which there is a confusion of is and ought, um, and a, the idea that building norms from facts might lead to skepticism or relativism <coughs> or realism or uh, devolution to questions of power. So I think mm -hmm. there is a kind of um, anxiety about what theory can say about practice uh, and a, a sense that the world of politics, if you get to that level, is so contingent or uh, struggle or filled with power that one can't effectively, all you have is a civil war of some kind. I think that that's a philosophic issue about orientation, but I also think um, there may be an, in, an, a, um, a deep uh, resemblance here as I've encountered. There's also means that substantively the focus of theorizing is on uh, institutions and the foundations of institutions on law especially and on rights um, and a whole range of what we might take to be politics uh, not just revolution but also social movements political parties are have not been political action have not been central topics of political theory or have not generated the same focus level of um, theoretical investment as uh, the foundations of, again, questions of rights and law, I think, in some form, and justice, theories of justice. Now, so I think there is an analog here. It's not, um, so I would be curious to open up what this, there is an analog here with, I think, maybe even a flip side with some, what we might take to be post-foundational critical theory, where I think there is also a suspicion and anxiety about what empirical um, positivism of some kind and also maybe an anxiety about normativity. A the flip side being, uh, I think, critical theorists are anxious about, in some forms of critical theory, about normativity. Normativity, uh, especially implying, a, a, you know, a full-blooded response to what is to be done. There's an anxiety about um, theorists that tell you how to wield, effectively wield power. Uh, there's an anxiety that these will also reinstitute power and hierarchy in some form. So there's, a, I think, an anxiety about to actually you know, take the leap as, uh, St as Stephen did and as Bernard wants us to say what is to be done because it implies any, as I said, any um, new, new formulation, especially one that actually takes the question of power seriously, will re re, um, reinstantiate uh, orders of hierarchy of some kind. So I think there's a different kind of anxiety. Now, as Bernard sort of indicated, I think some of these questions it can't be solved by just asking theorists to apply theories to practice, some of it is, I think, a real question about what we think about practice, what you can conceptualize about practice, what action or practice is, and competing ideas of what, and what I would say, what political action is and what its um, fundamental features are. So again, I think, there's, if, I think there is an absence of a real theory of action in, the, in, in contemporary political theory. And without it, you end up assuming it's pure power or pure contingency. But I think the irony in some ways is that though action, political action has been lost or has receded from the central, as a central term in political theory, it was obviously one of the most important and prominent strands of 20th century political thinking. Um, mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, Richard Bernstein's book tells us how central praxis in action was to 20th century philosophy. 
but if you th just think of, um, you know, even from within that book, if you think outward to Marx, Marxism from Lenin to Fanon and onwards, <coughs> existentialism from Sartre to Arendt, and so not surprisingly, Arendt is the, in a way the last theorist of action at the tail end of existentialism, progressive um, thinkers, anarchists, and of course, anti-colonial thinkers and activists, and just, you know, Lenin, Luxembourg, Lukács, Weber, Dewey, Sartre, Fanon, you can go on. Um, to Gandhi, King and Mao, this was, you know, what, what is to be done is a central question. And it is um, not just about, obviously the most in a way theoretically generative has been a Marxist debates on revolutionary practice. They are connected deeply with the critical theory tradition. Lukács is of course famous as a tactics and ethics. So in a way, all the way from high theory down. Um, but I think even beyond revolutionary practice, these texts were interested in uh, questions of what mass action is in democracies, uh, party politics, movement structures. And so I think even if you lose, um, you, none of them were, I think, dependent on a Marxist theory of revolution to generate interesting theoretical debates. And what is to be done is probably the classic text in which um, you don't need anything like a Marxist theory of capitalism to see what Lenin's real question is, is how to build a mass uh, movement or party under conditions of extreme autocracy. So um, you know, debates about organization, discipline, the spontaneity of revolutions, these are not, of political action, are not uh, things I think um, that, you know, I think these texts and these debates can still <coughs> um, be extremely generative for thinking about action. Uh, and I think in this sense, I wanna say what, what the way to rejuvenate them is not as applied theory, uh, applied theory of Marxism, for example, but see how from uh, this diverse, these diverse texts, but also movements, which is my interest, but I think it doesn't have to be movements, it could be parties, it could be frame, lots of different frames of action, forms of criticism, uh, how to generate a theory of action on its own terms or think through what's, um, so one, uh, so I would say as an example, um, you know, you can take, uh, if you take the question of mass action, you can say there are common predicaments or dilemmas of action. You know, there are maybe deeper theoretical questions about contingency, unintended consequences, tragic views. We said different, different uh, theory of action, Arendt, Weber, Lenin, they all have underlying theories of politics. But we all might agree that there are common obstacles, and certainly these thinkers, I think, recognized common obstacles to movements and parties seeking social change, questions of ideology and authority, uh, what contesting power structures looks like, strategic questions about tactics, efficacy, successful modes of ideology, critique, persuasion, disruption, and of wielding power. And so I think, to my mind, uh, one way to get at this, or at least one of the frameworks I like to think about is, is um, you know, changing the terms if we start from a question of action, then you know, especially moving out of a, a, the, a theory practice model that is uh, analogous to is and ought, then moving it towards a model of means and ends. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that, to me, mechanisms and consequences both uh, requires you to start in a way from the ground up, but I don't think it um, means that you have to um, leave, that you end up with a kind of, um, hard realism where you can't orient, orient yourself towards norms and ideals and utopian projects. So, um, so I think this, uh, so I think e if you change that from a framework of action, even critique would have a different orientation and purpose. Uh, again, it would you know, maybe orient itself towards things like persuasion <coughs> or disruption and have a kind of, um, I think, a more strategic focus than we are um, willing to, to take. Um, so, uh, and the last point I want to um, make is just one example. So, um, you know, the example is just the question I've been interested in. So, I'm interested in nonviolent political action and the, the theory of practice of nonviolence over the 20th century. Um, as I said, I'm interested in movements, but you, I think this question of action. Uh, which I prefer to practice uh, can, you know, you can, I think, think of it in terms of parties. There's a whole set of other, you know, things that we fall under the rubric of political action, a practical theory. Um, and one of the things I think has been ironic is 
So in the way that Marx's theories of revolution, I think, really were um, important generators of theory, partially because it was a constant global debate. Uh, and Le again, the Lenin text starts with this sense that um, there are conditions in Russia, but we learn both from examples from other places. But these are, we confront similar questions because we have common ends, and we do um, have uh, we are in a field of struggle that we can learn from each other and, and generate these concepts that travel. So as he says, there's no, you know, it's, it's, already, it's already already a global debate about what is to be done that activists are learning. And, you know, and that set of debates, as we know, was really crucial, I think, partially as you confront practical problems, new theories have to be generated because we know it's some, some important key events, um, the practice of politics uh, or, you know, overruns or is ahead of theorizing, which again is a Leninist formulation from what is to be done, that there's spontaneous action here and the, the theorists are um, lagging in some form. And I think, um, but, and, and Marxism, is, Marxism has been the focus, but I think if you think of nonviolent political action um, from the last 50 years or longer, this has also been a, a global movement that, ha and you can think of, I think, human rights maybe similarly, but nonviolence has been a global movement that has had um, theorist practitioners, uh, many, uh, similar, I think, online with Marxism, um, and activists have been trying to generate explanatory frameworks. Gene Sharp is probably the most famous, but also the social science literature, uh, and generating from these different instances, uh, trying to you know, generate a kind of ex a theory that can be used by activists. And I think one of the, I think a profound question is why um, nonviolence has been uh, completely ignored as a theoretical topic in political philosophy, um, except for Etienne Balibar, <laughs> I think very, <laughs> and uh, Hannah Arendt, and very Uwe few. Who they met now, but I mean, in terms of the 20th century, it's right. probably alongside totalitarianism, the mm -hmm. great innovations of modern politics. And, um, and Gandhi and King, as theorist practitioners, aren't canonical figures, especially King, Gandhi's closer, I think more people have started writing about him, but I think there is something there to think through why, um, why, uh, um, why those questions have not been t given an uptake in, in fields that it, are looking for um, questions of what to do. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, so, so I think for at least uh, in some sense, I do think there's a way in which um, critical theory and political theory uh, has to find some more reciprocal way of moving from ground up, <coughs> ground up theory, and maybe it might be reconceptualizing the purpose of theory along different lines. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, one of, the, and one of the important pieces there is the richness of the discourse itself somehow, which uh, I heard a lot in your discussion, the way in which if there is an ongoing discussion or debate, it's more likely that it's going to be productive in some way and that maybe, you know, there, there hasn't been that, that we've moved away from that in some sense so that, so that, so that there is less, so that there is less material for us to be mining and developing in some way. Um, uh, and certainly on, on nonviolence, maybe. Um, Anne, um, so do you want to take the microphone? Yeah. And um, I, I just wanted to say something as preface that in some ways I think I'm going to play devil's advocate both to Bernard, whose work I love, and to myself. Um, and ask, perhaps at least put on the table, whether there is a fetishization, a practice that we're participating in right now. Um, and it's coming from a particular place in my uh, own trajectory that makes me feel um, a little bit suspicious um, of what it's uh, taken the place of. So I want to thank Bernard for inviting me to think about what critical praxis might look like and about what <coughs> needs to be done that might garner inspiration from but cannot follow the directives of earlier moments. But in reading through his launch 
of this new series, and with the gift of having just read his extraordinary manuscript, which I'm carrying around, on critical theory and praxis, I realized that it was not really an invitation extended so much as an urgent call, a summons in both senses of the term, an interpolation, but also a demand to stop the sign, perhaps, of an accumulation of infractions that many of us unwittingly share. For the call is not to do better critique alone and to fortify and reinvent our political concepts and conceptual grammars, the latter task to which I'm especially partial, but to re-envision how the critical praxis of each one of us with respect to each other and to ourselves might speak to the unequitable conditions of privation to which increasing numbers of the world are subject, but to which we critical academics who write so assiduously about it are largely not. In the spirit of brevity, brevity I'd like to make several observations from the field in which I was partially schooled at Columbia, but precipitously strayed. First of all, as someone trained in anthropology, self-taught in Marxism, collectively taught in feminism, and with philosophy and history my passions, praxis as a galvanizing concept has had virtually no place. It's extraordinary how little it, the word is ever used in anthropology. I don't mean the idea of praxis, but the term itself, which I think matters. Why that is so in anthropology, I think, may have something to do with the pervasive and smug conceit that we who do ethnography in a critical, reflective, and ever respectful mode, mm -hmm. increasingly in context of violence and on the intimate entailments of them, have been doing critical practice under the, se under the name practice all along. I think it is more than a conceit, but rather evidence of a modus operandi that is critical but not confrontational, that garners kudos for the intimacies and privileged local knowledge we enjoy, but by and large, and there are many exceptions, those who, is, who have exited from the field, those who have been forced out, those who have blown the whistle, still skirts what critical praxis might mean as we sit perched or wallowing in the comfort of attending to practice, not praxis. We are immersed, our insights are poignant and intersubjective, we don't speak <coughs> for, but with, we attend to the unspoken as well as the articulated. That's been anthropology's yield. Scene one, for evidence. It's dark winter of 1982 in Paris, where I've been for the last three years finishing writing my dissertation on the confrontation of Javanese workers with multinationals like Goodyear, Sokfindo, Uniroyal, the mammoth precursors to the disastrous biofuel industry of oil palm today. Sherry Ortner, author of an essay that has become required reading for several generations, a de rigueur text on the rise and dominance of the study of practice in the 1980s, had sent an early draft to her friend and my partner, Larry Hirschfeld, for comments. I don't have time to go into the essay, easily available online, except to say two things. It announced practice and practice theory as a signature of the 80s, and had already supposedly taken anthropology by storm. Her insight was easy to corroborate, but there was something deeply amiss in the way it was cast. Struggle was almost surreptitiously removed from the lexicon and the agenda. As Sherry, Sherry then at Michigan, parsed M Marshall Solons, then the Dorian at Chicago, I quote, and this is a really important quote, radical change, says Solons, and this is really Sherry endorsing this, need not be equated with coming to power of groups with an alternative vision of the world. Unquote. Instead, he emphasized important, quote, changes of meaning in existing relations. Or in a nutshell, she wrote, people in different social positions have different interests. Unquote. Interests, maximization of interests, homo economicus, had already been slain for many of us before we knew the term neoliberalism 
what, 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 before he knew what the term neoliberalism was and had long rejected the reduction of personhoods to rational choice and maximizing man. Marx is there in Sherry's text, but utterly muted. For those of us who imagine that the signature of anthropology was to figure out how to demonstrate Marx's adage that people make their own history, but not exactly as they please. We were bent on keeping the macro polities of power center stage with the microphysics of rule. As Sherry put it, if practice once had the romantic aura of voluntarism, as the saying went, man makes himself, now practice has qualities related to the hard times of today. Pragmatism, maximization of advantage, every man for himself. It's not that issues of power and inequality were not there but somehow our attention to practice and attentiveness not shared by other social sciences was to give anthropologists a political standing and political credentials and purchase that other disciplines could hardly claim. We were there, they were not. Note again, praxis never enters the lexicon, even to clarify what practice might be. At the very tail end of the essay, Foucault, makes an awkward appearance. As a footnote, via a personal communication to Paul Rabinow, included in his book with Herb Dreyfus's much then called upon 1982 text. And Sherry at that time quotes um, with much um, pleasure, people know what they do, as Foucault said, they frequently know why they do what they do, but what they don't know is what what they do does. The footnote, laments that there was no room for Foucault in the essay. But what Foucault stood for at the time was already centerfold with Edward Said's assault on the academy and what was at stake there. And with Foucault and for many of us, it was the politics of knowledge. And Sherry was right to cite what was just emerging in the mid 80s to revamp the field. But something else was afoot as well, a swell that would challenge the foundations of anthropology in a way that practice theory could never do. Anthropology's praxis, that is its critical impulse to question foundations and to interpret all the way down, came with a more fundamental new vigilance with respect to the politics of epistemology. Not only that of ethnography subjects, but of anthropologists themselves. Scene two. Indeed, practice 15 years later at the hand of the mainstream anthropologist Michael Hertzfeld at Harvard is reinstated, not as what an ethnography should focus on, but really the signature of the entire discipline and who we are. Anthropology has become defined as, I quote, practice of theory. Practice of theory in opposition to, but building on Bourdieu's theory of practice and logical practice. In Hertzfeld's final words, theory as practice and the intimacy of the observational scale is largely what distinguished anthropology from its closest neighbors. Emphasis here is given to practice and agency on the fact that what we take to be common sense might not be theirs. Ergo, anthropology is a comparative study of common sense, another conceit that we do know and can know, the unarticulated habituations by which people often with rudimentary language skills, that's us, and from a year living with them in a particular population. So the issue that might have once allowed the conjunction and to join theory and practice, and yes, with what Kaina warned us against, theoretical models that view practice as simply the sphere for the application of norms. And anthropology hasn't been a recent issue. The notion of mere application was scrambled all along by the very understanding of what ethnography is and what ethnographers do. In recent history, there really has been not theory and practice that prevails, but rather the practice of theory. That of indicating several moves. One that valued ethnography was practice all the way down. And that no theory can remain in the abstract, nor can its creation and innovation come from abstract principles. Practice of theory is situated knowledge. Knowledge production is an activity and a collaborative one with those with whom we think and work. And at least there is a moral high ground to the focus on 
our practice and theirs, be, their being with responsibility that, and theirs. That is, being with responsibility, cachet in the trenches, and accountability follow. This is admittedly something of a character. Thinking about practice perhaps was not a problem in itself, but I read deep political consequences in it. Not in ethics of discomfort, as Foucault would insist, but in ethics of comfort, where they are doing the right thing. Two, somehow, practice and praxis were fundamentally pulled apart the radical possibilities set to the side. Action was sorely disdained in what became somewhat disparagingly called applied anthropology, <clears throat> as if being applied evacuated the possibility of conceptual production. Being too involved remains the thorn in teaching students about participant observation. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we move forward to 2001, Michael Hirschfeld will declare anthropology a discipline devoted at once to the comparative study of common sense and the practice of theory. Note that the relationship is not cemented with an ambiguous and between theory and practice, but with practice at once producing theory, and not only, not only the practices of those who we study, but our own practices, so it's playing on both of those, reflexively considered <coughs> as the bulwark against, I quote, the vanity of expertise. The astuteness of Sherry Ortner's early observation in some ways paled next to its moderating message. Let's all focus, however differently, on practice, and everyone will be sort of on the same page. Transformation in the order of things need not be a confrontation of, I quote, alternative visions of the world. The latter phrase, probably the most identifiable horizon in anthropology now, of where critical anthropologists see themselves today. At the heart of the problem may be something else in conclusion. Not that anthropologists don't and haven't studied politics and involve themselves in local and global political struggle, but something that moves closer to what Stephen also gestured towards at the very end of his piece. If we are to understand what might make up critical practice and praxis, then we had better be well equipped to broaden our understanding of what counts as politics. Where it is, the forms it takes, the scales at which it can operate. Our appreciation that the political content, Carson Hayden White, might be in form. Critical praxis is dead center on our table. But unless we have a more capacious capacity to identify the political and endorse its critical edge, I'm not sure from where critical practice can come. Thank you. Wow, okay. Um, uh, seeing the, the political uh, here. Um, so, uh, so I'm gonna open it up in, in one second. Uh, I just thought that uh, I, I, there, were, there, were, there, were, there were three pieces I think that really link uh, the interventions here and um, and and I and I I'm, I'm going to open it up rather than return to our speakers uh, immediately, uh, so that we can hear some more voices. But there there are three pieces here that I'm st I'm still puzzling over. One one is uh, Stevens uh, call that so the notion of the prefigurative, which plays a big role in a lot of the work and the way that we've been thinking about uh, action today. Um, uh, particularly with Occupy Wall Street as a pre prefigurative form, um, uh, the performative aspects in, uh, in Judith Butler's work of assembly. Um, and, but that's, that, that represents a real challenge, I think, to uh, how we should ourselves engage these questions of praxis uh, in our own work, but then also certain limits on where that may lead us with the work, I think. Because, I mean, the, the notion of the prefigurative, which is such an important one and which seems so central, um, is going to have deep implications for this question that you, that you 
put on the table, Stephen, of, 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 of are we dealing with enemies or are we dealing with adversaries or are we dealing with uh, uh, competitors or et cetera and, and what the norms are, right? And, um, and I think that ties right into Karuna's intervention about uh, the, the perhaps the lack or the movement away from theories of action. Uh, because again, I think that so much of those so much of the thought about action in that context is going to be uh, uh, centered on these questions of, of um, what St Stephen was talking about, about the prefigurative, but certainly in the context of nonviolence. Um, and then that leads us to uh, Anne Stoller's intervention, which uh, really raises the question of uh, the politics of knowledge. Uh, in such a way as to make us maybe have second thoughts uh, about our own invocations of a, a movement towards praxis or our own invocations of what it is that we are uh, invoking and calling for. Um, so uh, uh, rather than come back to you, I, Jean Cohen's got a got a question and wants to intervene. And there's a mic right there. Emily, do you want to pass that on? Do, can you turn it on? You might need to turn it on or something. Uh, that way we can all hear you. Um, yeah, it, it'll, it'll turn on. It, it'll turn on. Uh, just tap it and it'll. John, do you another have one, one that works? None of them? <laughs> We're sabotage. That one works? This one or this one? No. Yeah? Can you just speak loudly? Probably not back there, then. Probably not back there. Hold on. Uh, we'll get this. We'll get this fixed. One thing we can do is just pass this around, I think. Good idea. Check, 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 check. Got it. Got it now. You guys will share that one. I got this. Uh, is this? Yes. yes. So, I, so I just want to make a, a short comment to Karuna, a defensive one, and then a, um, a statement uh, to Stephen. So um, I don't know when this... Uh, um, lack of attention, uh, certainly of the, of the Farm for School of Critical Theory, um, <coughs> supposedly occurred to movements and nonviolence. Uh, uh, because um, I at least count myself amongst the third or maybe fourth, I was confused about that generation of uh, Farm for School Critical Theory, among other inputs. And uh, I did spend a lot of time writing about social movements and theoretical paradigms and strategy. And not only that, also civil disobedience and nonviolence. So it's not just about me. I think that. Um, for the n new left generation of, of farm school and other, that's not right. So I don't, I'm just wondering when that happened. I had to set the record straight. Um, but in terms of Stephen's presentation, uh, I agree with, I agree with it, 99.9% um, .9 of it. I, I just wonder, I think it's an excellent analysis and uh, a good description of the situation that we're in. But I wonder, if what you think of, of this, or, or, uh, th there's not enough of a diagnosis, and I'm wondering what you would think about this. What if, of, I mean, the object domain of politics is power, of course. So it is distinct from the other fields and raises questions of truth and power in a way that the others don't. But would you be willing to follow me and say that what you're actually addressing is a narrower conception of the field, namely democratic politics? And the question then becomes, um, it was a shared, it was a field that had, um, con you know, shared, um, it was a universe that people understood what it was about, although there was very serious and radical disagreements about what is democratic, how democratic, all that stuff, you know, no question about that. Antagonism, if you want to do that, instead of agonism, whatever. But, um, I mean, sorry, agonism instead of antagonism. I don't like that formulation, but it doesn't matter. So, it was that kind <coughs> of a field, and there has been, I think, a change in which that um, shared conception of what we're even doing, of being in the same universe, of general 
um, in the Bourdieuian sense, understanding, uh, although contested, that this is, has, is gone now. And it's gone um, not only in the United States, but in many places. And so um, I, the term asymmetrical political polarization, I think, is right. It comes from, who is it? I'm, I, either Ziblatt and somebody, and, or one of the political scientists. I always forget their names. But I think it's true that this is a radical change. And I would like to ask you um, what it, and we are entering into, into a domain of, uh, well, you could call it many things, electoral authoritarianism, is, it's a risk or, um, well, I won't go into that. But I would like you to speak to the question of what is occurring that has led us to this, or what has not occurred, however you want to put it, that has led us to this radical shift um, and uh, that enables us to do a friend-enemy kind of polarization that we really didn't have in the same way before, despite the fact that there were socialists and all, all the kinds of movements. <coughs> Nevertheless, I, I, I do agree with you that we're, in a new, we're, in, that we're experiencing something new, and I wonder what you think about that. Good. D Jason Franks wa wants in right now. Uh, so, and, and, or so should we, okay, why don't, you, why don't you take this one and then, and then we'll uh, come to you. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. Well, I mean, that I, this is really exactly what I was trying to say. I think I don't know. I don't know. We, we couldn't really say we're there. I think we're on the way. I mean, I think there is a transformation. It, uh, what I was trying to articulate is the sense that something really tectonic has changed, and this uh, this. Ca uh, so you are asking me this really big question of why? What? What? Where has? What? What has brought this about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From dem from well, democratic as a as an overall label for this sense that we're all playing the same game, yeah. and the idea, and of course, huge disagreements about within it. But now the idea that somehow the game itself is in question, that seems to me what's happening, and it is happening elsewhere. Look at Poland, look at Hungary. I mean, uh, the the, the it's it and India, I guess too. I mean, the idea that somehow. So why? And I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want to uh, answer this or try to answer it. I, I tried, there's a section in my paper where I try to say, how have we got here? Why have we got here? And I think it, it, there are several things you could say. Um, I mean, certainly observing what's happening, we, we do now see that, that uh, in, in America, uh, alignment, I mean, um, uh, the, the partisanship. I think we have to focus on what what generates partisanship? And one th finding from political scientists is that it's become increasingly negative. People are now voting and identifying against rather than for. This is a huge question. I don't know whether I want to dominate now, but, but uh, I do try to say some things about it in the paper I circulated. Um, okay, so uh, there are quite a few people who, who want to get in, and I would propose maybe we'll take uh, three and we'll try and uh, try to try and link these as much as possible to have a conversation. I also uh, want to jump in, but let's yeah. start with Jason Frank. All right. Um, so these were three very provocative <coughs> discussions, but I think you know since Hannah Arendt is the the shared text yeah. that that we've read um, for this meeting, I, I'm going to ask a question. I guess it's primarily directed to Stephen and Karuna, but it might be relevant to the the questions that Anne raised as well, and <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a question that I guess gets us to think maybe in more concrete ways about the relationship between practice on the one hand and action mm. on the other, which is of course, that's a rent central category, it's not practice <clears throat> or praxis, it's action, um, and also gets us to think a bit more critically about the role of the theorist. So mm -hmm. in, I, I think that even if we limit ourselves to the a rent essay that we've all read, the Truth and Politics essay for today, there is a very different understanding of that relationship um, and of the role of the theorist that comes out in, in both Stephen's presentation and in Karuna's. Mm -hmm. so, and, and I, so I guess I wanna hear you respond to this and, and I'll, I'll say a, a very briefly what I mean. You know, Stephen calls for, the, the, the call at the end is to defend the fields, right? Politics is understood in terms of a kind of social theory of fields. And therefore, like what we're, the what is to be done question is a kind of norm preservation question.
question. Seems an totally antithetical to what Hannah Arendt is interested in when she's talking about uh, the greatness of the public realm. Um, and again, her, her, her category is action, not practice, not fields of, of meaning, not regimes of truth. And so I'd just like to hear Stephen respond to that. And the way that I think it, it, it bears on Karuna's presentation is that even the very subtle account of a kind of neo-realist turn in political theory that Karuna brings out. I mean, I think she's, the shared terrain of the neo-realism that you identify in, in Arendt is the suspicion of ideal theory, the suspicion of the application of ethical norms to political life. But I also think there are aspects of realism, certainly it's instrumentalism, the strategic thinking that you're interested in, and even the more nuanced version that you put forward, this entanglement of means and ends, that is very antithetical to what Arendt means by world disclosive action in a space of appearances. I think that the strategic dimension, the instrumental direct dimension, drags our understanding of politics in a more rule conception, understanding of politics, an instrumentalized conception of politics that Arendt is really trying to, to push back against. So I guess I just want to bring her into the mix here because I think that she poses some provocative questions, certainly in the way that we think about the relationship between practice and action that um, are very, very relevant to right, what we're right, discussing. Right. And, and, um, and I mean, I think, I think that also goes entirely to Anne's intervention in the sense of thinking of our own um, thinking of this as it applies to us as, uh, as anthropologists or, uh, or sociologists, sociologists yeah. or what, what uh, our, our term would be. And um, um, uh, Jesus Velasco? Does that work? Is that one working? Yes. yes? Okay, yeah. great. So um, I'm not a political theorist uh, or a scientist or anything like that. But, uh, and, and also, just try it. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't want to be the one who quotes Trump here. So I'm, but so, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do go it. Ahead. <laughs> do, do you remember those moments in which he said, of somebody else, they are all words and no action. Mm -hmm. So that that's points to one question that is a very naive question that I have, which is what's to be done is a question that is being asked here, but has been also asked by those who brought about those tectonic changes. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, maybe we need also to understand, not just diagnose, but also theorize their, their theory of action. How did they ask what's to be done and turn that into no words but actions? What are those actions? How can we somehow, you know, or in a certain way, perhaps just in a philological uh, um, um, play, distinguish praxis which we want to put on top of the table in order to ask this question from those practices that uh, seem to be as yet untheorized and that we need to understand. That's just that. Yeah, mm. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's really important. And, and in part, um, thanks to a, a guest we have this year, Lars Eckerman. Uh, we're actually we we are actually going to be having a session, right, on on alt right writings to to, to precisely understand that question of how um, how the question has been posed and answered in other contexts, right? Which I think is crucial. So we can come to that and 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 um, tying that back before I go to uh, Pedro, um, in terms of um, of Arendt, yeah, I mean, it, it, we we need to return to the text also, yes. Uh, in large part because it is, as I tried to introduce in the, in the introductory post, I mean, it is based on this distinction between theory and praxis. I mean, and, and so in, in such a way that it becomes truth and politics is the, is the divide of theory and practice. <coughs> but Pedro, is there a... Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. So uh, besides the tension between theory and practice that I realized was the ground of the seminar, I would like 
to ask the panel about the, the, the tension, unaddressed tension between praxis and poiesis, and asking us, what if we uh, would shift our focus from critical activity to creative production, from a focus on the agent of the revolution to architecture, and architecturing a new world, <coughs> instead of uh, thinking about uh, uh, the politics of transformation, poetics of imagination, instead of radical action, crafting an utopian horizon, and thinking about this whole tension between poiesis and practice, since that nowadays the left seems to have only dystopian nightmares and no, it has run out of yeah. utopian dreams. And so Orson Welles and has forgotten about the utopian tradition from Marx to Plato and uh, Thomas More. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, thanks. So yeah, right. Okay, great. So we've got a, we've got our, we've got our plan for next year, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it's going to be yeah. Boyesis 1313, Absolutely. right? Uh, uh, okay. No. Um, let's get two more comments before we turn back to our speakers, Clayton and then Dana. Hi. Um, so this will be a comment mainly for Professor Luke's, but also will involve some of what Professor Mantena was talking about. Um, so I am not confident that I agree that there is a large distinction between the fields of journalism, science, public administration in terms of norms being settled versus politics. So you said that uh, ver norms can be up for grabs. And so in each of those fields, we see normative shift, right? Um, uh, as to the standards of what is acceptable and good practice. I think that the shifting of those standards can be virtuous or it can be vicious, right? Um, and in politics, I think what you're pointing out is that it seems that those, that shift can happen a lot more easily, right, um, based, on come, based on who takes power, right, and who is dictating those terms. Um, but here, uh, and so one thing that I was thinking about throughout, and I wrote a short post on this as well, is that the person that I think in connection to a lot of what has been said, and this might be because I was in Princeton this past weekend, is Jeffrey Stout and Democracy and Tradition. And in that work, um, he argues for a way to think about the norms that are implicit in our practices. And this will allow for conceptions of normative development right, that we can identify those practices that we think are healthy to democracy, um, and we can identify the norms implicit in them, and we can make them explicit, but this allows us to still develop norms as we go. And here is why I think that this connects to the idea that maybe we can start with action, is that maybe the theory of action does involve some normative conception, but we start at the actions to start thinking about what those norms are. Okay, great, thanks. And, and thanks for your post also, Clayton. Um, Dana Schmaltz. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the question that I want to ask or that motivates my intervention is really how, how do we get closer to what characterizes the kind of praxis we are looking for? But I want to start with what Jesus Velasco also said when we, we have seem to have a broad agreement on the diagnosis, but it sounds so similar to a diagnosis also from um, the far right or however we want to <coughs> label populist right. And not just, uh, one is this stop the words, where's the action? And the other is also what's been repeated a lot, this um, absence of absolute knowledge, uh, absolute truth how to distinguish it from the absence of truth or from the giving up on the search for truth. And in both ways, well, it makes me think that the, at the basis of critical theory, in a way, stands the claim that theorizing is action or there's right. no clear distinction. Yeah. And this 
Hegelian critique of Kant, where its praxis comes first before the theorizing and is the theorizing. And then with this connection in mind, I wanted to think, wh what is this distance which we all still diagnose and where we see a problem? So one, regarding maybe this question of absence of absolute truth, I find this um, axis you proposed with means and ends very useful. And when we say, well, theorizing is a form of praxis, then the kind, uh, how we do this praxis matters. And that might be the whole distinction, whereas we still agree on the absence of truth. And, for, and then I wanted to bring in one thing from the RN text with the, her claim or her description that philosophy is about man in the singular and political about man in the plural. And we do not necessarily have to agree, but I find it insightful to think that when <coughs> praxis, maybe we can say, is related to man in the plural, then even theorizing as <coughs> practice, it matters much more, and I guess I'm still, I guess, who speaks and um, the fact that we are in the plural and that maybe theory as theorizing as action um, must start to focus more on listening. And then the very last point I want to make is that I kept thinking about that, well, with, what is the distance or also we said that maybe we shouldn't speak about praxis but action. But so the first thing um, which comes to mind is maybe that this is about bodies. The difference is that there are bodies involved. And somehow I d feel very uncomfortable with put, putting it down with bodies. And I thought maybe the most useful terms for me of thinking where, where, where do we look when we diagnose this distance is the terms repercussions and responsibility, that it is about the effect of our activity or what we do, whether in theory or in practice, in the world, and that taking responsibility or thinking about responsibility also distinguishes the call for praxis in a good sense from this stop the thinking and just deeds. Thank you, Dana. Um, so maybe we'll uh, go back to our guests. You want to do that now? You, Stephen. So, as to so many things. Okay, things, but then we're going to move on further, are we? Yes. And then yes. We'll move on oh, good, good, good. Well, I, I, I mean, many things have been said, but I, I mean, I'll just focus on two. Um, you, the, the first speaker said something about contrast between what I was arguing for and, and um, also, I guess, Karuma on the one hand and Hannah Arendt on the other. I don't see that myself. I mean, we were writing, uh, we were writing in different times, we're living in different moments in history. Uh, I find what Hannah Arendt has to say about praxis and, and politics and what matters and you know where our focus should be very compelling, but it, it's focused on the problems of her time. And mm -hmm. of course, they they uh, span from you know the the the, 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 the Nazi period, uh, totalitarianism to. Um, the 70s and the 80s, I mean, when she was writing about revolution. But uh, I, I, you, you used this phrase, that you said, I was arguing for norm preservation. I actually think that's where we are. I mean, I, uh, just in general, that's where we are. I mean, I think the left, just to make a very general comment, has become, has to become conservative and defensive in the face of the onslaught that we are living through. And um, the kind of norm preservation, just to be a little more specific, that I was talking about in respect of fields, I mean sp specifically science, uh, journalism, the law, public administration, these are under threat. I mean, seriously, seriously in need of defending. And um, so uh, that's why I mean, that, that explains the focus. And I, don't, I quite like the idea of norm preservation. I mean, I think that, I hadn't thought of the phrase, but that's what we have to do. Um, we have got to protect uh, climate science. And we've got to protect the activities of journalists themselves. And, and also, we as citizens and everybody has to just somehow to find ways of defending uh, objective journalism. Objectivity, I mean, just to go into one little corner of the complex issues, of course, means 
something different in journalism and in, uh, in science, social science. It, the different, I mean, scientists do mutual, in, involved in mu mutual um, uh, uh, um, preservation of, of the activity of being a scientist. Um, <coughs> you can criticize all sort of aspects. You, you once said, asked me, what do I think of peer review? It's a very bad way. Uh, but, but nevertheless, scientists check it on each other. Journalists do fact-checking. I mean, this, all of this is under threat now. And so that's why I talk about non-preservation. And that's where I think, to be very concrete, the field of praxis or practical action has to focus. Now, you just uh, and comment on, on what you said. Um, you wonder about whether politics really is distinctive. I mean, you make a very good point about norm development and the need to think about how uh, norms develop over time th that can be developed in, in, and that's a historical process. All true, of course. But there does seem to me to be a clear distinction. It isn't up to scientists. I mean, let's say interested in scientists to decide what science is. They don't, they don't decide that by winning. Uh, they have to convince each other. And uh, similarly, you know, why are Fox News journalists, Fox News presenters, not journalists? They're not journalists. Um, journalists know who journalists are. Uh, I mean, that's a crude statement, you may say. You may say, well, all, you may point, you may suggest, you may say to me, well, look at all the power fight fights that go on within the journalistic profession. Of course, but nevertheless, most journalists who are worthy of the name will tell you who are not journalists. And, and similarly, and here I, I, I defer to Bernard, but I mean, I think, you know, not anybody counts as, I mean, you can be, you can be um, uh, hounded out of the profession of, of being a journalist, I mean, but being a lawyer. Why, I mean, is Michael Cohen a lawyer when he engages in corruption? No, at a certain point, there is, there are things which, if you do them, you disqualify yourself. So all of that's what I mean. Now, that's not true in politics. Uh, to be, I mean, being quite concrete now, I think politics is a game about the game, and that's what distinguishes it. So I, uh, that's enough for the time being. I mean, the other things are really interesting. Karuna, yeah. Okay. Karuna? Sure. Can you take for a second? And, uh, yeah, those are um, great questions, and I, I think I'll only um, maybe touch on a few of them, starting with the RN question. Cause, uh, so I also am very interested to hear, I've been thinking about what the difference between using a term like action is versus practice. And I, from RN, and I also think um, you know, why I prefer action, because um, I think I imply with what RN does too, that it is plurality. And it is in, if you think of the very older, very old Bavarian definition, social action is, um, necessarily interactive so it, it, it isn't some a practice I think in some version and I some version can be practices of the self and it can be making of the self so I am curious what so I find what's useful about action in some ways it's it's always interactive um, and it has that built into it and plurality but I do um, agree that I take Arendt's um, so I think there's a lot of Arndt's theory of action, which I think is very helpful, and it comes out in truth and politics, the mm. space of um, the fragility of facts in the context of the realm of plurality. And that is for it's something, and in some sense, for her, a theorist as a truth teller is anti-political, um, up to a point, and uh, Socrates and others aren't engaging in um, mm. plurality in some form. I think she may be wrong on that, but I think, um, but I, but I do think that she does make a, str a strong. Um, I think it's. I think I don't. I don't think her. So she does have a critique of a means ends logic as being techne in some form, and instrumentalist. And I think that's not true. Um, I think you can be strategic and not be instrumental. And <coughs> I, I think that's a category that can be opened up. And so that, therefore, I do think. I think our reliance on prefigurative and in aren't that would be relying on exemplary as the yeah. only form of action I think is very limiting and I do think what we need to open up is forms of strategic action um, that aren't instrumental and we can think through what's wrong with instrumental because it, it treats others as objects and I don't think all forms of interactive strategic action has to do that. Mm. Um, but I also think means and ends doesn't have to be just mean strategic either in the sense that it doesn't necessarily just mean act means versus ends as goals it's also a 
and I think, again, I would go to Weber. The debate on means and ends was also ends as consequences of action, and um, thinking of politics as a vocation, it's, it's thinking through what your, you know, at some level, uh, you can't always control, but as a quote that you had, you can't control, you, can con you may not be able to fully know what your action does and control it, but being self-conscious about it and thinking through potential possibilities is also thinking strategically, not necessarily instrumentally. So I think I do differ, and I, I don't think Arendt is entirely consistent in her defense of uh, action as action in concert or participatory action. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think um, her I think her idea of exemplary action versus you know, what this what action in concert can be if it's not strategic mm -hmm. in some form. It's I think a hard it's a hard soak. But I think they're very interesting, and I think it does cut, cut to this question of techne or poesis or other forms of yeah. action. And I think coming back to the norm action means ends. I mean, I, I would just think that I think some of those questions, I think they're open to us to thinking, what do we think our current political situation demands in some form? Is, do we, this, I think the diagnostic element matters. If the problem <coughs> is polarization, mm. then we are looking for um, forms of commonality, perhaps, or, or struggle <laughs> or victory. And I think that would, you know, then I, I don't think we can assume maybe before the fact, um, we have to make a claim about, is it that we lack imagination or do we lack common practices that can um, create common norms? Or is it that we need to persuade an enemy to being something less than an enemy? And so I do, and I do wonder if, even though I do think we are in distinctive times, obviously there are many other, um, situations in many other countries in many time periods in which you were living in extreme polarization, a tendency towards uh, the outbreak of civil war even, and even mm. if you think of just Martin Luther King, who I always end up, I mean, those were, you know, you're struggling against pretty antagonistic times. So I, I, I think one has to, that's I think what means and ends helps is what, what's the crisis, what's the end or the goal that we take. Then we can think about what action needs to produce and it could be a variety of things norms as well as connections or yeah i'm not sure i i, I think i'm the black sheep here in some way i mean everybody's sort of sitting reading arendt and I, I mean here i am at the new school and i've just never been an arentian and i never really got it uh, why it's why she matters so much to so many people really sacrilege for me to say um i i, I find that she's somewhat sloppy in a lot of her concept con conceptual grammar. And uh, I don't get traction from it. I, I, I find it just melts in my hands. And action is one of them. I don't know what she's talking about. Um, I don't know what action is. I want to look, look at effects. And I was really appreciated Pedro's comment, because it's where I was going. I was thinking a lot of Ranciere, I was thinking a lot of aesthetics and politics. I was thinking of enlarging, making far more capacious the space of the political in many ways, and I know this is not, not you know, what I should be saying, but in many ways we're speaking still within a frame of what's the political. Everybody here is still speaking within as if we're all in political science. We're not, and I'm not, I don't want people to be in anthropology, uh, that's for sure. But, um, or, or maybe history, maybe philosophy, but I still feel there's this kind of framing of, of where we're how we're supposed to be speaking about, about politics. And it seems to me the political is actually in question. The very forms, what, what Raymond Williams would call those structures of feeling which are emergent, which are beyond semantic availability, as he put it. Beyond semantic availability. The, you, we, uh, what we've been talking about today hardly touches that which is beyond semantic availability. There's a whole aesthetic that runs to this, and I don't just mean art, but I mean Concept work is the poetry of thought, as Agamben says. You know, I mean, lots of people say it. It's not just Agamben, right? There's, there's some way in which we've let ourselves still be held in by how we already identify what's political and what's a, an action. And I was thinking so much of performativity, of John Austin, so much of, and, and, uh, of, of, 
of paricia, of fearless speech, of isn't that moment in the agora when I speak, isn't that an action? Um, and you say, yeah, we weren't contesting that, Anne. But there is a way in which we have some kind of, in our minds back here, something about action. I don't know where in the body it's located. I don't know if it's just putting myself at risk, which is the major action that's going on. The very fact that I put myself at risk, which is one of the definitions, obviously, of fearless speech, right? That is not one of the definitions, one of the criteria of fearless speech. So I'm a little, I'm a little worried. I think a lot of deliberate irreverence, um, of strategic, strategic um, irreverence, of the ways, and we have used the word strategic, but not action, just action. I want to know, and I know that, that we've talked about, well, action towards a norm that we agree upon, but I don't even know if that's the way it's going to be possible to go. It seems like there are things that have to emerge in new configuration that we don't have the vocabulary or even the instincts or gestures to, to bring into our midst. And I, I'm, I'm talking about myself in, 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 in great part, that there's a limit to, um, to where we imagine the political is lodged and how it's going to man manifest and how clearly we're going to recognize it. And I don't think that we're going to recognize it, and it's certainly we don't recognize it many times. So. Uh, thanks, Anne. Um, so the problem is even greater in part because not only do we not recognize it sometimes or do we not see it when it's in front of us, perhaps, um, but even, it, it, what it feels to me, even when we are directly in it, mm. um, the interpretations on these questions of norms are so open. And I just want to take one example, which is directly in it, right? Um, the letter by the anonymous uh, uh, Trump official, right. right, last Wednesday. So clearly we are in it. I mean, so we're not, we're not stretching the bounds. We're not right. looking at our own practice. We're, we're in the political space. But the issue there really is this question of preserving norms, precisely. Preserving norms, which I think was also in Arendt's essay. I mean, the whole idea that we have moved to a situation where there is such this gap between politics and truth, where there can't be, where, where, where factual, not just theoretical, but factual truth is completely um, uh, absent uh, from the political, uh, is a question of norms. And I, think, and I think that that letter actually raises a fascinating question of norms in multiple different ways, but this one particularly. Um, there are, of course, two interpretations of what that letter was about. Right? One was, I think, a return to the norms that you are in part, Stephen, mm. talking about uh, preserving. Right? The, the gesture in the letter, of course, to John McCain, and of course it was following John McCain's funeral, was entirely a gesture to a particular kind of political norm. It was the old norm. It was the old norm. I think it was captured best, for instance, when you know, there was this, uh, this shot of George W. Bush secretly handing a candy to Michelle Obama, right? Was, you know, and it was like, oh, right, those, the good old days, right, when, when, uh, when the Republicans and the Democrats could sit next to each other and pass candy to each other or something like that, whatever. But, and, that, and that this was a call for a return to those norms, a return to preserving those norms. Right. Now, another interpretation of this right, is that it's a set of Republicans who are essentially trying to demobilize the left by making, or the center, by making the center feel that there's a steady hand on the state. Mm -hmm. right? 
Now, that's not norms. That's, that would be an exploiting of norms. That would be an exploiting of the entire McCain image and uh, kind of, you know, we can work this out, we're steady. It's, it, but it's, it's, not, it's, not about, it's not about retaining norms. It's a purely strategic move. It could be a brilliant move on the part of certain Republicans to keep the center from flipping in the midterms, right? So just don't worry. If, for those people who are out there, centrist Republicans, we've got control of this. You don't need to vote against Trump because we're at the helm. Adults are at the helm. I think that was actually in the, in the passage. Adults are at the helm, right? Now, yeah, yeah. Now, there are adults in the room. Now that's not preserving norms, that is, that is as calculated, strategic uh, an effort as one could imagine. That's, I don't know if that's an enemy or maybe, or an adversary. Um, uh, it's, it's pure political strategizing and it could be brilliant, but one <coughs> thing that it's doing is it's playing on the notion of preserving norms. It's playing on a notion of civility, right? Which notions of civility, <laughs> are always constructed uh, for, I would say, for political purposes. Um, so, so I think that's a, that's, a, that's a kind of a concrete challenge. It's, it's, it's so within the domain, we're not even kind of expanding to the, to the larger domains of our own right. uh, political productions, right? But it leaves me very concerned that if, that that move to the preserving of norms, uh, whether, whether that is just a, a political game uh, that can be won or lost, <coughs> right? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. So we've got some more questions, and then maybe we'll come back. Yeah, or you want to you want to come you want to comment on that? Okay. No, no. I mean, I, as for those two alternatives, I mean, I completely go for the second. Really? I mean, this was completely strategic, and it was basically saying, you know, um, actually, it was appealing to people's horror at Trump, at Trump, which I'm sure is pretty widespread, and saying, it's not. Don't worry, it's not so terrible. It was addressing the horror and saying there are adults in the room. No, I completely agree. But I mean, that's not what I, I didn't have the, that letter in mind when I talked about preserving norms. I mean, I think that if, if that's what preserving norms uh, would be, then we're fooling ourselves. Uh, I mean, what, what, uh, what's involved is actually just uh, is, is going, is, is citizens actually and, and politicians and everybody trying to just get the, the, the practice of politics back to uh, some kind of uh, situation where people respect each other, but that, th this isn't the way. Um, okay, so uh, Emily and then, uh, yes, so we're gonna pass the mic around, but uh, Emily. Um, well, I wanted to follow up on um, questions that Karuna was asking at the beginning of her presentation about who are the agents of revolutionary change and also to follow up on Anne's suggestion that we widen our sense of what the field of politics are and to ask a question about um, collectivism and the state of collectivity. And if we're talking about praxis, um, presumably there's not a way to act politically alone. And so when we start to think about a move from theory to praxis, with whom are we imagining that we act? And how do, to, to what polities are we imagining that we belong? Is it the nation? Is it the city? Is it the institution? Are there, are there other kinds of solidarities that we can invoke? Um, and how do we, is that still a live question mm. after we stop thinking about class or the proletariat, we can't use those categories anymore, but what, what, are, the, what are the categories, the remaining categories of the collective? Thank you. Uh, Diana Moreno? Hello? 
So my name is Diana Moreno. Um, I think I'm going to speak maybe in a different language because I come more from the advocacy and litigation world. Uh, but one of the things that I, I feel like we have faced when advocating, for example, for women's rights in this racing uh, right wing, including anti-women's rights um, uh, ideas and, and backlashes is uh, the sense of we need to react. Uh, we need to react automatically and then actually um, asking ourselves, oh, actually the, t the, the idea, the strategic idea of just reacting maybe just be distracting us because we actually should have our own ideas and our own political project to pursue in this moment. So in that, I'm with uh, Pedro and the need of actually rethinking uh, for, for what thing is it that I'm going to act. Um, and uh, one of our uh, first reactions was actually to preserve. For example, in Colombia, we make a gathering of human rights organizations, women rights organizations, trying to analyze what was going on in current political times and actually thinking about how to defend what we had won. Mm -hmm. But from the critical theory perspective, I believe that's so problematic because I sort of believe critical theory has been unveiling, right, time by time, how the structures that we have are actually mm. wrong. So what are we playing when we are planning to keep on, like what we, uh, so, so what, is, what is happening when suddenly we have been criticizing democracy and now we're turning up and holding to democracy? What's happening when the left has been uh, criticizing globalization and suddenly we're holding on to international law and to globalization? Um, the good thing about crisis moments uh, is supposedly that it's a moment for huge movements. Movements that can go very bad or movements that can go very well. So is it maybe <coughs> the moment to actually not holding up but being more ambitious? Um, <coughs> is it a moment in which if we are going to hold to something, we should hold to it in a transformative way? Although that I know it seems paradoxical. But I'm not. So I, I just want to say that I, I do worry a lot to what we are holding on, but I, I really push forward that we need to say what is it that we're pushing for. Yeah. What is the, if, if this is about changing the game, then what is the game that we are proposing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I'm a bit of a practical polit politician. I uh, was active in the in United Nations in diplomacy in the 90s. My question is primarily to uh, Professor Lukes, but also others who are into uh, talking about norms. My norm question is basically, uh, it seems to me that norms have different sources. Hmm. In a healthy democracy, Norms, I think, are more stable than they ought to be. And they are basically uh, strict respect for constitution. Uh, they are basically governance norms. Uh, I recently read about Senator Dirksen, the minority leader of the 60s, and uh, a, uh, a Princeton uh, historian, whom I don't remember, said that he was an example of those who believed that legislation is a very serious lifetime business, and they like doing it. I think that's no longer the case. The norm mm. has changed in that respect. Why has it changed? Because the norms are from a different source. Oh, by the way, I think it's also very interesting that Dirksen said, I'm a man of rigid, strong principles. Uh, and uh, one of my principles is flexibility. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, the point is, I do believe that demo uh, democratic politics is basically two things. It's governance and it is electioneering. Mm -hmm. And uh, the present norms can largely come from electioneering. And that is, that, so those are different sources. I wonder if you have any mm. comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. Darshan Amitra. Um, so I have, um, I, think, I think I have three questions and they mostly come from, like Diana, my, uh, the fact that I'm a 
practitioner, I'm a lawyer, and I mostly do advocacy. So I think my first question really is that this, the figure of the truth teller, as Hannah Arendt you know, describes it, it seems to be, and it flows from questions that have already been asked, I think, it seems to be a very figure of an individual. And uh, it's a little troubling to me because I don't know what that figure uh, does to the idea of praxis. Because I think of, for example, if you're representing a tribal community, uh, which is at risk of, you know, for example, the entire livelihood, the entire, uh, you know, village being submerged by some large developmental project. And that representatives from that community stand up and speak of the truth of their lives. Then who is the truth teller figure here? Who is the practitioner in this, in this equation, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state? And I think I, I personally found it really troubling when reading the essay and all of the essays, in fact, that we kept going back to this individual figure. And I do think we need to start thinking of praxis in, in more collective terms as well. But I just don't know um, where to go. You know, After making that imperative statement, I don't know how we can move on from that. Um, my other, other, uh, the other thing that troubled me was how does, uh, how does the idea of this theory uh, practice, practice uh, divide uh, interact with identity? Uh, because I would, I, it seems to me on the face of it that uh, um, it's almost a privilege to be able to call yourself somebody who straddles the worlds of theory and practice because you know, it, it, it's a privilege that flows from a certain kind of identity, certain privilege that you occupy in this world. And for somebody else, for example, in the context of India, if you're lower caste, uh, you know, if you're white, for example, in the United States, or not white, sorry, if you're, if you're black in the United States, then um, theory is just you describing your life and practice is just you living it. So it's not it's not a, 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 a category that you are, uh, in some sense, privy to. So, and my third question really, again, <laughs> stems from my, my troubles with identity, which is that um, even in, when we talk about norms and we talk about, say, norms within journalism or norms within the scientific community, um, I think sometimes norms, not, not norms themselves perhaps, but the trope of norms can also be exclusionary. Uh, that using norms as a trope, you know, to say that, uh, you know, that uh, you need to stick to these norms of journalistic conduct or you need to stick to these norms of journalistic practice can also exclude many people from accessing these fields. And I'm, I'm wondering how we understand the production and the setting of norms and the use of norms uh, in this context as well. Thank you. So um, I've got four people on the queue. So let's try and, let's try and bring their voices in, uh, starting with Michael Harris over there. So if you could pass the... Uh, in front now, and while you're um, while you're getting the microphone, I just wanted to interject uh, something uh, that uh, Diana Moreno was saying, and the question about uh, returning to these um, uh, illusions that maybe we had tried to deconstruct because we're in a in a, in a particular situation. I mean, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about mountain climbing. You know, it's just, I mean, in the sense that you know, you know, you've got to hold on to something sometimes, right? And and you're in a, when you're really in a fix, uh, when you're in a spot, it's like you're gonna, you, might, you might need some international law. That, now, the way you treat it doesn't necessarily, it does not necessarily conform with the theoretical understanding of, say, liberal political theory, but all you might need to do is just hold on to that for a little while to survive, you know? And, uh, and so, when I, when I suggest this notion of a kind of a pure theory of illusions, it is one in which you know you're getting rid of something, but you're in the process inevitably probably creating something that then you're going to want to get rid of. Right. I mean, and hopefully you can leave it behind you. It's going to be like lower, and you're still going to be alive, and you're still going to be trying to go up uh, rather than down. Uh, so sorry, I, it was just a <coughs> mixed bunch of metaphors, but it was. <laughs> going through my mind as you were talking. M Michael Harris? So I, I want to address the question of preservation of norms uh, from the point of view of a mathematician ah. uh, because uh, so m I was a little bit surprised to see mathematics, science in particular mathematics, uh, invoked as a kind of anchor for truth because it seemed very, <laughs> very quaint. Uh, about 100 years ago, mathematics was in the middle of a very energetic uh, foundational crisis, which resolved itself in a way uh, that I think in some sense is, is an exemplary uh, 
instance of, of uh, cooperation for the preservation of norms. That's how mathematics functions right now, but it's, it's never without, without tension. Mm -hmm. And now, um, thinking about the radical science movement of the uh, 60s and 70s uh, through the 80s, uh, one of uh, which in, 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 one, uh, in one direction that was uh, over overlapped with uh, standpoint epistemologies to the point where the uh, question of the norms w uh, was actually uh, a matter of, of conflict. And uh, I was, I guess I'm not surprised, radical science is being revived right now. I'm not surprised to see that in the, there's, there's a debate over the kinds of norms that should, should, should uh, govern mathematics in the very pages of the American Mathematical Society uh, the point being, the argument being that uh, somehow the norms that are being preserved are those that were created uh, in the interests of specific uh, category of people, which to, to oversimplify being uh, white males. And the, uh, there, is a, there, is a, there are serious discussions as to whether mathematics itself has to change, mathematics and the sciences more generally, in order to to uh, accommodate uh, <coughs> other perspectives. Now, uh, so this, this, uh, this overlaps with the, so this is actually happening. I'm saying this is, not, this is not something I'm making up. This is actually happening now. It was happening 25 years ago and it's happening again now. And it's a, it's a very lively discussion, although people who are not mathematicians are probably not, not aware of it. Uh, this, this overlaps, uh, so the question is now, if, if this is a period of crisis, uh, are these the, 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 these uh, pe the vectors of alternative norms uh, speaking out of turn? Is it the wrong time? Or is it is it not the time for them to be raising these demands? This is this overlaps with the, the comment by uh, the woman from Colombia. Uh, it's I find it, and I'm not the only one. Find it uh, uh, distressing that uh, so much of uh, the left is looking to the FBI and the CIA and people who were who were just uh, unspeakable <coughs> a few years ago as as the last uh, protection of of, uh, of democratic norms. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, great. So we've got three more uh, uh, questions starting in the back and in the blue. Um, and please introduce yourself when you um, and uh, I think what we'll do is we'll take those three questions and then we'll come back to our guests to, to, uh, to uh, give closing thoughts. Hi, thank you. I'm Johnny Gross. Um, my background is in art and philosophy and my ears started to ring when I heard Pedro speak about po an emphasis on poesis and uh, developing new architectures and I would add to that new, new forms of language. Um, my question is more of raising a concern or wondering if there are going to be further considerations for the um, creative production of this seminar I itself. Um, I think about how um, it's particularly exciting to be here and this is a seminar that's focused on praxis or practice or action. I'm gonna just kind of sledgehammer them all together. Um, because to my ears they sound the same. Um, and one of our speakers mentioned something. Now I'll digress for just a quick second. But he mentioned uh, how could a Fox News analyst uh, or journalist call herself or himself a journalist? Um, and no amount of theory will ever justify that action. But that's exactly what it is. It's just an action. So <laughs> to bring this to a point, it's... Um, and what I'm kind of beating around the bush here to say is I think that our creative production really matters. The format for this seminar really matters and there's a certain architecture in this room that I've seen before at more theory-oriented seminars, uh, like the Nietzsche seminar and then the Foucault seminar before that. Um, what I found particularly exciting about this one is that maybe it would embrace new models or new architectures, as Pedro had said. Um, and I think that would be one important aspect of moving forward and moving, perhaps moving forward here at the end of the 13 uh, s sessions. Thank you.
Thanks. That that um, that um, fits. Uh, Anne, did you want to say something about that? No. <laughs> okay. I'm great. Just thanks. Uh, let's yeah. Let's let's take um, the young man right there. Hi. Thank you for uh, the presentations. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask a few things about. Um, instrumentality and action, and in particular with Hannah Arendt, because I think there's two other aspects of the Vita Activa that she really elaborates on, which are labor and work and action, which are equally all com composites of that kind of um, system, that she's way of thinking. And thinking of action instrumentality, I, I just kind of felt a little bit of a, that that kind of fit more with kind of her thinking with, um, with mm -hmm. labor and work, and that um, that's actually her critique of Marx, is that he tries to reduce everything down to certain means and ends, and that's why he prioritizes labor, and she's you know trying to build up a kind of a more general sense of like action, um, orientation, uh, and, and combination with labor and work. And the other thing I also wanted to um, kind of speak to, and maybe in addition to having elaborated on my first kind of um, comment is, um, a notion with authority and power that Hannah Arendt also makes within her um, you know, own writings is that she makes a clear distinction between those two things and how authority has a certain type of foundationalism and that like, you know, what gave authority um, its different kind of class from power was something unique and that um, authority was something that was acknowledged and acquiesced to and power was something that was imposed and authority was something that was established through foundations and she gives the example of, you know, particularly the Roman Republic and that, you know, it's about some type of foundation which might be speaking to the type of norms that we were maybe once speaking to back to towards before, but it seems like the things that foundations or norms seem to be motivating is a certain type of authority and not necessarily a certain type of power, at least in an Arendtian type of language that we're kind of been discussing back and forth today. So um, I just wanted to add those kind of two kind of um, sense, I guess, and themes in and just would love to hear some responses. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got two more interventions. So um, one over there. And then <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Astrid Kalorakra and I'm an undergraduate student here. Um, I want to direct a question specifically towards Professor Lukes, um, also around this question of or idea of norm preservation as being what is most called for. Um, and I want to similar, like simultaneously tackle it with this attempt at a search for what exactly led us to this crisis-like situation that we find ourselves in. Because I want to posit that potentially it's, I think it's possible for a moment to assume that some of the norms that Professor Lukes are talking about, particularly in the political sphere, such as participation in, in a democracy are good ones, but it's rather their lack of actualization that has been the problem rather than like the norms have their standing and um, might as ideas and as norms have had their standing also in the past, but maybe the problem is not with the norms themselves, but with the fact that for the majority of the people, taking the example of participating in a democracy, it has not been actualized, and therefore people have been seeking towards um, other directions on the poli poli political continuum. Um, and then asking if moving forward, should we not, rather than just aiming at preserving the norms as ideas that, um, people of privilege can also execute, but instead hold on to the ideas, but actively fight for a larger inclusion of people that can take part in privileges such as democratic participation, which although the norms have been standing highly has not been the case and might have been what has led us here. Thank you. All right, um, good question. Uh, that we will return to in one minute. Um, Julian Juarez. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, I just want to come back to the starting point and what happened and this 
I mean, what to be done, and but to understand or to think better wh what to be done, what happened before. And I was thinking that the critical legal studies or the critical theories in general, not, not, so, not, not only in law, uh, has responded to social movements, to a social reality that maybe today is not so evident. So I'm guessing, I'm not sure, I don't have an argument, but maybe we can think on the, maybe the intelligentsia, the academy, the scholars, uh, have adopted a uh, certain complacent attitude or uh, there's some status quo in the academy. I mean, there's like a, okay, the left thinking, the critical thinking is like a, today is like the status quo. So maybe there is no such need of revolution, of changing, changing things because maybe it is not felt, it is not understood as a need. So don't you think that for all of the uh, speakers today, that that may be one of the causes, one of the the origin of the of this crisis of this like, yes, kind of complacency in the in the academy. Okay, um, back to us. So, uh, so and I was just going to put something on the table that kind of has concerned me since we've been talking about this cataclysmic moment in which there is no longer truth. And every time I listen to it and I think about it, I think of colonialism, and I think of empire, and I think of a long, long history, as Derrida would say, a long history of the lie. And one that if we, we keep talking about, well, with this kind of parentheses, we're talking about dem a democratic state. And I wonder if we are talking about a democratic state or one that we wish was one. Um, and that if our model was not a democratic state, but more the Philip Roth's, you know, what is it against America? The what? The plot, the plot against America. Um, that there's a kind of flip going on. There, we're in an autocratic state, actually, in a very different way. And everything that we're parsing as, oh, this is so extraordinary. Oh, I can't believe they're lying. Is, totally the norm, absolutely the norm for an imperial state, absolutely the norm for a colonial state, absolutely the norm for Israel. It's exactly what Israel does over and over again, and that's supposed to be a democratic state. So what are we talking, why do we keep reverting back to this, this, this nostalgia of some kind of democracy that I don't see us in at the moment? Thanks, and yeah, so, um, and I, uh, I appreciate that intervention, uh, and it's funny because, um, you know, when, when, you know, for this seminar, you, you think about so many different ways of opening it, of starting it, of intervening, and um, last Friday, I was walking through the library, the, the law library, for, for, for another purpose, and all of a sudden, I came across these two volumes of the laws of slavery, um, in this country, uh, all of the codifications of slave law, um, black codes, and um, and and it had like it just. I, I actually took them off the shelf. They're now on my desk. I was going to start there. I didn't, but it was because of the way in which right, this democracy right, had such a robust rule of law in that period. Mm. Such a robust rule of law. I mean, it, it's, it's just remarkable. The, the, rights, the, the rights that a, an accused slave had in terms of being represented by an attorney at the cost of the slave owner, uh, of having a, a right to appeal, of having cases in cases where they were accused of poisoning uh, their uh, overseer of actually getting the case reversed because their testimony had been uh, elicited uh, previously through uh, uh, enhanced interrogation, right? But uh, that, and that, and that, that they had repeated it in front of the magistrate, but the actual slave owner was there when they repeated it in front of the magistrate, and therefore it should not have entered into court. And it's just, and just going through this, these, these legal rules in an entire different space, realm, right? malleable 
malleable, mm -hmm. so malleable, right? And, um, and I was actually gonna, gonna start there in part. I, I think that that is the, the, the bookend of the yeah. colonial and yeah. imperial space, right? Well, it was, it's our own, right? It's our own. Um, Stephen? Goodness. I mean, I, these last comments, uh, of course, they, they make us realize, I mean, remind us that we've really not got to have any illusions Certainly no nostalgia. We've got to be fully aware of all the, the corruptions and, and ways in which, uh, as you just, for example, said, the rule of law can be a cloak for brutal, massive, coercive power. And that's, I mean, Anne's work, but everything she said today is all about colonialism, all true. Nevertheless, when I talk, I mean, somebody invented in this discussion this phrase, norm preservation. And okay, <laughs> fine. I mean, if, if, I'm, if I'm supposed to be labeled with the uh, defense of norm preservation, I, I shall get uncomfortable. Uh, not, not any old norms, for God's sake, obviously not. Um, which norms and, and, and so on. Uh, and here I, I think I'll just sum, sum up, sum up where, where I'm coming from very quickly. I mean, I think we are actually in a somewhat desperate situation. When I say we, I mean in America specifically today, now. Uh, we uh, need to hang on, to use your climbing metaphor, to something right now. And what we need to hang on to is the preservation of norms to begin with in, in what I was uh, focusing on. Various background fields that within which our politics I I exists, I mean, which in with which any democratic politics, uh, on which any democratic po politics has to rely on to function. That's to say, there has to be a practice of science by scientists, not uh, politically driven. I mean, what you had to say about mathematics, I found extremely interesting, but frankly, I mean, of course, I mean, the social studies of science and so on, just to diverge for a moment on this. Those debates are fascinating, and they are obviously in some ways political too. But the en at the end of the day, who decided this issue about mathematics, and who is going to decide it? Mathematicians. I mean, we're not gonna, uh, you know, think about Lysenko. I mean, there is a difference between doing mathematics and not doing it. And I'm, that's a very simple remark, but I think I it's the point I was trying to make, that we are at a moment now where Climate science has to be preserved as science. Uh, evolution is not, I mean, uh, d d what's it called? Um, creative, uh, what's it? Um, creation science is not science, and so on. I mean, these, these very simple uh, claims have to be fought for now. We're in that moment. And similarly, we, uh, the remark I made about Fox News, journalism, I mean, so the norms in the first place that I'm concerned to preserve are norms for the functioning of really basic institutions. As for the rule of law, well, we have a long argument to have there, but I mean, I, I, what I think is, uh, is, with all respect to you, as lawyers say, um, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I think that um, uh, the law is not infinitely pliable. I don't think you think that either. It's not infin infinitely flexible. It's, in, it's always, I would prefer to say, always vulnerable to political, <coughs> to, to the imposition of uh, uh, interpretation by power. But there has to be some understanding of a sort of dialectic here in which, in which words do constrain statutes and laws. If not, is, is it any longer law? I mean, anyway, that's a discussion we have to have at our next uh, conversation. Uh, and, and, and public administration I didn't even mention, but that's had, that has to do with preserving the norms of actually pursuing policies which are uh, in the public interest and justified in public, which takes us to our end. And there, um, I think what we're actually facing is precisely in this country right now, um, whole departments of state run by people who are opposed to the very missions of those departments, and they're being depleted. And so you've actually got the, the need to preserve the very, the very um, 
functions that government is there to, to, to engage in. Now, all that said, so those are the norms. So I, I, in the first instance, I'm concerned about preserving the norms of institutions upon which any democratic politics has to depend. Then, uh, of course, we can talk about the sort of issues that this gentleman was raising about what, what are the norms of a liberal society. And there I agree with the undergraduate who, who said, uh, well, of course, we've got to extend the, 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 um, the, the scope of the, the, the practice of these norms. It, 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 it is, of course, it has always been and will continue for uh, a, a long time, I guess, to be ex extremely exclusionary. Th there you can raise all sorts of questions about, for instance, whether, well, I, I, I could go on. But those are basically my, so I think there's a priority here. I, w I love these comments about poesis and, and, and the need to think about creative possibilities uh, and, and expand our notion of politics. All of that I'm completely on board with now. But we're in a defensive mode right now. We've got to protect our, our uh, institutions from the massive onslaught that's happening. Because I think it picks up on this uh, point and a couple of questions that came up, I think, about is politics collective and, um, and I think the point about um, preservation. So I do think, it, just following on what Stephen just said, I, and I think all of us have, I um, politics is about uh, creativity and construction and I think there are no, so I think the sense of what a, there is, I don't think one has to take it to be a pre-existing community. I mean, I feel like part of what it, what does it mean to say is politics collective? I would say it's interactive. There's always a kind of hail and interpolation, a call <coughs> towards someone as being part of your community in some form, um, whether you're struggling against or <laughs> including. And so I think in this sense, the question of um, norm preservation I think the one at least, and it's many things, I mean, action is also, you know, these norms are also aspirational or they are creating mm. communities. They can be radically redefined from it within. So I do take this point that I think it is a danger to be reactive, entirely reactive. And mm. I think actually something like the rule of law, I don't think we can take flexibility to be a negative thing. Flexibility could mean radicalization or resignification. So, and also that mm. in that openness, so one on the left, we can might think of the rule of law as a defense against the abuse of power, and someone else might think it's a preservation of constitutional norms, but we can build a coalition around that, at least temporarily, and still fight out later. So I think that's the, mm. um, those are the kinds of things that I think we should think of it as the practice of criticism, the practice of action is about creating communities and also trying to figure out um, what are the kind of guiding norms or creative imaginative ideas that can um, energize different and break down maybe the polarization or again sometimes you just want to struggle and have victory but in either case you have to I do think you have to have, you have to be more than reactive and you do have to redefine something and democ you know I'm with Anne on both the critique of colonialism and that if if we, if democracy is a term that can guide action, then it's it's open for us to redefine it. And so there's no reason to, analytically, we might still say we're living in autocracy, but aspirationally, we might want to use that term. So. And you, oh, I have a, do you have a yeah. you you're, 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 yes yeah yeah yeah. Okay. Well, um, so. We do have a, a, a significant outstanding issue that we haven't resolved, which has to do with the malleability of the law. Um, and uh, I actually tried to, we had a marvelous uh, debate over lunch uh, about that. Um, but uh, I didn't, I didn't want to just kind of monopolize the conversation, but we definitely need to have that conversation. Now, I was thinking, I don't know, in terms of Poesis, maybe we'll start a podcast uh, component to the um, Praxis 1313 and do it that way. Uh, but we, we um, but that is, I believe, central, central to our current situation, to the way in which the law has been deployed uh, uh, and in by uh, brilliant, by brilliant attorneys uh, 
uh, in the legal counsel's office to, um, to legalize forms of, uh, of torture, uh, indefinite detention, um, uh, summary execution uh, uh, that we uh, in the United States are engaged in right now. Um, so we will need to come back to that. We will need to come back to that. Um, so let me, I want to thank our guests. I, and, and before we go and before we all applaud uh, the extraordinary interventions of our guests, I do want to remind you that so we're going to take the deep plunge into the deep side of the pool, into the cold, freezing <coughs> water uh, next session. Okay, so we're going to be reading 13 texts over the course of the, over the year. Um, but the first one is uh, the um, uh, Invisible Committee, uh, Comité Invisible. It's a French uh, anar radical anarchist group that has written three books, an anonymous group uh, that has written three books. Uh, first, uh, The Coming Insurrection, then Maintenant, uh, no, then uh, A Nos Amis, To Our Friends, and then Now. Now is the most recent iteration. Um, so we're going to start there because um, I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, start in the dark, on the, on the uh, deep side of the pool. All right, so we'll start there on October 3rd. Please join us. We'll have Judith Revel from Paris, the philosopher who will be here. We'll have Ken Wark from the New School, and we'll have Jackie Wang uh, up from Harvard. Uh, Jackie Wang's work actually has been cited by the Invisible Committee, so it should be particularly interesting. I hope you will join us for that, and I hope you will join me in thanking our extraordinary guests for their presentations. Thank you.